because we are almost almost completely done with the course but there's still a couple more lectures to go luckily these are one of my favorite lectures to teach the first one is uh, written language and so um, written language when you think about language speaking we think about speaking we think about signing written language is something that um, we probably think of last and in the scheme of how language was created the origins of language written language was something that probably arose last as well so for example if you had 24 hours on the clock uh, written language would probably clock in at like 11 15 p.m and so um and this makes sense when you talk about um you know the benefits of written language and the utility of written language is that we have something to show future generations, and so it has to be a language that is fully developed, right? I really like your discussion about pigeon tutorials and whether or not they're full-fledged. Um, so, uh, you know, for something to have a written language, it has to have some sort of sustained, um, it has to have some sort of power authority behind it. And so there's a lot of things that um, come up, like that go uh, with the privilege of being a written language. And so um, our first one is start with this video. It's about the Voynich Manuscript and World's Most Mysterious Book. So it's a short clip, but I hope that you can watch it and um, kind of figure out what is the uh, mystery behind the Voynich Manuscript. So the Voynich Manuscript, um, so, you know, in the video it mentioned that uh, it is named after the founder who discovered it, but this text has been around for a long time. So they did carbon copied, and they dated it to probably the 1400s. Um, and so the mystery comes from the fact that it stems from some sort of written language that we're not familiar with. Um, and so it's very script-like, you can see that here. Uh, and it looks like it's a natural language. It doesn't look like someone just, you know, made some sort of gibberish. Um, but the other interesting element is that they have these weird images of naked women. So uh, maybe you can try to figure out what that was about. Um, naked women bathing. They also look to see whether this language was something that could have been, you know, inspired by... Um, the god. So there's a study called Glossalia, Glossalia, in which, um, you know, it's a science of um, being overcome by religious, religious doctrines or religious spirits that causes you to just write, you know, it's kind of similar to speaking in tongues. Um, and so they discovered that and, you know, it didn't look like these were random. These are very patterned. Um, it didn't look like someone was, you know, just looking at something and just, you know, copying down the speech. Um, so it was something that's very natural and a very natural flow to it. One other interesting thing is that it just, you know, it depicts these naked women, but it also depicts these, these random scientific, you know, esque, um, organisms. And so, you know, this person, whoever wrote this text, knew about cells because these look very much like the cells in your body or these look like the kidneys um and so maybe it was like a pre-doctrine to some sort of medical text that a lot of people had um we're not sure we don't we are not familiar yet with uh, no one's cracked the code on the Voynich manuscript yet we have these sunflowers um uh, we have other plants in the new world um but the interesting thing is the book was found in Italy, and the New World hasn't been discovered yet, so it's maybe a time traveler. Um, so, right, so some indigenous plants in North America, but not found in Italy. And it also had these constellations um, in which it depicted the stars. And so um, you could actually turn this around, and that would actually be the constellations um, in, this, in the map of the stars. But this is before telescopes were invented. So again, very, very, very mysterious. Are there any explanations? Um, my guess is aliens. <laughs> um, or it could be just, you know, a civilization that used this text and then the civilization died. Um, other people have posited that it looks very akin to Chinese, although they asked Chinese people 
and uh, they were like, no, this isn't anything like Chinese at all. So um, we're still not really sure, you know, what the Voynich manuscript was saying uh, or the secrets that it holds. But, you know, um, language in the news, other types of written languages are also being discovered. So um, this is Nushu. It's a written language only for women, and it's based off of Chinese. So we know about the history of Chinese. Uh, people, they were not allowed, to, women were not allowed to uh, write, read or write. And so they kind of developed their own kind of written language uh, that looks like a skinnier version of some of the like, kan kanji that's found uh, in written Chinese. So uh, very, very, very interesting. They're actually, when we talk about language revitalization, uh, they're actually trying to revitalize new shoe and teach it not only to women, but also to, uh, to boys as well. So how do we decipher a language we know nothing about? Um, and I, you know, I, if you haven't seen the movie Arrival, I would recommend it, you know, because, you know, Amy Adams is an amazing, amazing actress, but also she plays a linguist and she um, is trying to decipher the language of this alien race that comes uh, to Earth. And so she's trying to figure out, okay, so what... Is it about their language patterns? What do we know about, you know, their communication? What does it say about their culture? And so the movie is really, you know, um, it says a lot about the superior wharf hypothesis, um, which a lot of linguists would look down upon because it's saying that, um, you know, your language determines your culture. And so now people would probably say, well, it probably influences your culture. It probably doesn't determine your culture. Um, so, you know, um, I think as far as when we are unfamiliar with a language, we start to look for patterns and we start to figure out, okay, so what are the types of reoccurring images that we see and what does this say um, about, like, the history of the written language? And so when we talk about writing, writing is a symbolic representation of language through the use of signs. And so the earliest forms of writing were these hieroglyphics. Uh, in which you use a uh, signed and the sign signified something, the signifier and the sign to be read this year. So the difference between writing and speaking, um, there's a lot of differences. The, the, you know, one is that writing is very different from spoken speech in that it's more conservative. And I don't mean like it's more Republican. I mean like um, when only certain types of writing forms uh, are allowed to change. And for the most part, writing doesn't really change at all. So for example, the types of essays, like the essay that you'll write for me, the type of writing, the academic writing uh, that you'll be using is very much like the types of writing that they used, um, you know, like 50 years ago, right? Whereas spoken speech, like no one speaks like, you know, a 50s uh, person anymore. Um, so spoken speech has changed a lot, but writing um, is something that people keep very dear and people try to police it a lot. So I think that that's why it's more conservative. Um, as we talked about in past lectures, children can speak very naturally uh, when they're exposed to the language, depending on whether you're a rationalist or empiricist. Um, but, you know, either it's natural or through exposure. Um, but children don't need to be formally taught how to speak their first language. Um, however, children, all children need to be taught how to write. Writing is something that um, it's, we associate with literacy. And uh, we think that writing is um, something that someone needs to sit you down uh, and actively teach you what these words mean, what the, what the alphabet is, how do they combine together to form words, um, etc., etc. It takes conscious effort and instruction. And so writing is something, um, you know, as someone that teaches writing, it's very difficult uh, and it takes multiple revisions to kind of get it right. And really there's, even though people will say that there's like an accepted norm, um, there's actually lots of different norms. And so um, uh, the thing with writing, like I said earlier in the, in the lecture, is that it's relatively recent. And so the types of writing styles that you see um, are uh, very recent in the evolution of language. So, 
the creation and development of the writing system is considered one of the greatest human achievement. What is the greatest benefit of writing? Um, the greatest benefit is really the fact that we can look at these ancient texts and be able to read them. So there's a form of knowledge that's inscripted there. If someone says something to me, I might, you know, if I don't write it down, then it'll just be lost forever. But if I write it down, it will be, it could be carried on through generations. So for example, we have this cuneiform writing uh, from ancient Sumeria, and it says, Bridegroom, let me caress you. My precious caress is more savory than honey. In the bedchamber, honey filled, let me enjoy your goodly beauty. Lion, let me caress you. And so, you know, probably some of you are like, oh, that's really sweet. And then others are like, this is awful. But the fact that we have this type of writing uh, says a lot about the um, the perman permanence of writing and the endurance of writing over time. And so we would say that's humans' greatest achievement, that we could talk to each other um, across generations. And, um, you know, writing is very ingenious genius in that uh, we're, we have we have certain um, diacritics otherwise known as like punctuation. Uh, so an English professor wrote these words on the chalkboard. A woman without her man was nothing and then asked her students to punctuate it correctly. All the males in the class wrote a woman comma without her man comma is nothing. All the females in the class wrote a woman colon without her comma man is nothing. And so you're able to kind of, like spoken speech, how you're able to differentiate your tone based on your voice. Uh, in writing, you can get a lot of things. Um, you can, uh, you know, you can differentiate your meaning based on your writing. And so I think that that makes writing something uh, a little bit more nuanced in this manner. So, of course, earliest writings, we have cave drawings, right? Um, and so these are pictograms. So pictograms are a direct image of the object it represents. So this could be understood language independent. So you don't need to know all these different languages in order to understand what something is. You can just uh, figure it out based on what the object is. So, for example, in this object, uh, you can try to figure out that, okay, so... You know, there's probably someone with a bow and arrow, and this is probably some sort of deer, right? So the deer is going through, uh, you know, animal, and so we would probably say that uh, this represents hunting, right? Um, because it doesn't look like these people are really caressing these animals, uh, and that they are uh, very much used for probably game or meat. So earliest Chinese characters were pictographic. And so if you don't know Chinese, you can try to guess what these characters are, uh, what they represent. Um, and so this is one, or sorry, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, and so these are pictographic uh, characters because we can kind of try to see, you know, these might be a little more abstract, but you can see this is like, this one line, this is two lines, this is three lines. Uh, and so these, um, these could be understood language independent. And so um, Chinese characters used to be like this. It used to have some sort of pictographic form, uh, like a bird or water or a mountain. And through time, it becomes less pictographic um, and more something like this. So it would represent uh, the character uh, a little bit more abstract, I would say, or a little bit... Uh, more uh, arbitrary so uh, over time it loses its pictographic form and this makes sense because it's very hard to draw like a bird every single time that you want to have a bird it's much easier to draw the different strokes although a lot of people when they learn Chinese as a child uh, they associate it with the, the moon or the sun first uh, and then they draw the characters and so Kind of learning the shape with the characters um, and it's very nice that way I kind of wish English or Rome Romanized alphabet kind of had something like that um, this video I will say is a little uh, sensitive it's a little um, I think it's trying to make fun of Americans um, but a lot of my students think it's really funny but uh, it just kind of shows you that Chinese characters are pictographic 
um, and I'm really sorry for anyone who was offended by this video. A lot of people say emojis are pictographic. Uh, so for example, you know, you have, uh, you know, a smiley face, like that's something that people can understand. Um, this is probably a hot dog or this is probably a block of cheese, right? Um, but I will also counter, are emojis really pictographic? Could they be understood language dependent? Because upside down smiley face could have very different meanings. Um, so right here could mean that you're greedy with a green tongue, right? Uh, it could mean you're, you know, you uh, are just feeling lucky maybe. You won the lottery. Um, and so some, yes, are pictographic, but others probably not so. So another type, uh, a variant of a pictogram is an ideogram. Uh, so ideogram could represent the physical form, but can also be interpreted as a metonym. So beyond the simple recognition of the objects themselves. Um, so for example, a sun could be a sun, right? Or it could also represent heat or warmth or, you know, daytime. Uh, so it could be the sun itself, that's true. Or it could represent more than uh, the object, it could represent an idea. And so some ideograms still use archaic images to represent something more than itself. So for example, if you have an iPhone, you probably notice this um, button right here, right? And so this button has what is, uh, was like the telephone receiver, right? Uh, you picked it up and you hung up with it, right? And so this is very strange for future generations because they never had that kind of receiver. All they did was press a button. Um, and so future generations might have trouble with this. Um, the same thing for, you know, old terms such as hang up, to hang up, you know, or to dial. Um, because you don't really do those things with an iPhone. You just press a button. Um, other examples might be to roll down the window, right? Because windows, uh, maybe you still have these cars, but windows you used to be able to like hand crank them so they would roll down versus just a button. Um, and so how will future generations react to this? Some of you mentioned on the discussion board kind of how technology uh, will impact children. And so I'm also interested to see how um, certain iconic images will also change. So uh, pictogram represents the picture, enneagrams represent something more abstract. They do not represent words or sounds. Um, but the difference between a pictogram and an enneagram, sometimes it's very hard to tell. It's not very simple uh, to tell. So um, here's some funny airplane um, safety rules uh, images. Licorice is conveniently stored inside a flotation device for snacking. Female passengers with mustaches will be politely asked to leave the aircraft. If sharks try to front, just try to be like, just be like, talk to the palm, because you're into bomb. Um, so logograms, they do represent the words of the language. So it's not necessarily that the symbols represent uh, something. Uh, and that also makes sense when you think about, you know, writing over time. You know, very hard to write like, okay, I didn't mean the sun, I meant warmth, right? So how would you know? Um, and so over time, they developed a system in which they had uh, like a symbol, and the symbol would represent the words. And so uh, it really becomes more and more and more arbitrary. And so cuneiform, where the poem uh, that I read to you from Anxious Mary came from, represents uh, the words of the language. Uh, using this like block shape and this is what cuneiform means it means like a wedge shaped uh, that they would use and they would um, have a hammer and they would drill on to the rock so um, trying to figure out which one is the bird which one is the fish and which one is the ox um, so 99% of my students don't get this right but this is actually the fish this is the ox and this is the bird and so over time, these signs become arbitrary. You kind of have to like shift your head to the right. Um, whereas, you know, this looks like a bird. This looks like an ox. This looks like a fish. But over time, you probably couldn't figure out um, what they meant. 
And so we have something called the rebus principle um, in which they stand for the sounds that represent the word. By themselves, they don't represent any meaning. And so it's less about the signal itself, and it's more about the sound it makes. So for example, could you guess what this word is or name is? So if you're, um, it's very hard to guess, but this is a U, this is a hem, this is a B, and this is a C. So it's U, hem, B, C, U, and B, C. Um, very hard, right? Not very effective for writing because it probably takes you a long time to try to figure that out. But it's cool for like crossword puzzles and the book mentions some examples. Um, so over time we have what's called syllabic writing in that we have uh, a symbol that represents the sound. And so we said, okay, well, this is a more effective, uh, effective measure for writing because, um, you know, instead of having to memorize all these different characters, uh, some people will just have different sounds and they have different symbols related to those sounds. Um, so if you can, are well at that spoken speech, uh, the written language is based off of that spoken speech. So for example, um, what is this? right here how would you pronounce this a lot of people would say barbecue but it's actually not barbecue it's bbq right um, literally it's bbq but we associate it with barbecue because we're associating the sounds with syllabic writing so that's that's kind of an example of, of um, how we would think about syllabic writing and there's syllabic writing in other forms so for example this is uh examples from cherokee where there's certain certain uh, symbols that represent sounds themselves, but don't represent the object or uh, the abstract concepts. So the all words in Japanese can be phonologically represented in 100 syllables. Um, Japanese, for those of you who are studying it, bless your heart, uh, but they have three writing systems, the hiragana, the kanji, and the katakana. And so the hiragana is used for um, spoken symbols, the kanji is borrowed from the Chinese, and the katakana is the syllabary that they use. Um, and I think that this language is a very, this system is very um, inclusive. And I'll give you some more examples. The hiragana, for those of you who are studying Japanese, um, you're able to read certain characters right so you're able to figure out okay this is how you pronounce certain things right um like a bear will be kuma right uh and so a lot of people when they have hiragana they can pronounce things even if they don't know what it means um and so this is a very you know this helps a lot of foreigners uh learn the japanese language so uh just a review about the history of writing Writing systems has emerged throughout time, and so, um, you know, it comes from different places. Uh, but it started out with pictograms. Those are those, you know, those images that could represent um, the thing itself. And then over time, um, you know, these, sil these symbols took place to represent the sound out of just the meaning. Uh, so here's another rebus principle for when I had tests, which was start now. Now plus cow minus a C. So thanks to the rebus principle, um, we don't, you know, have picture-based pictograms on writing. We could like break through towards syllabic, syllabic writing, um, and then we'll talk about alphabetic writing. So examples of katakana would be like uh, Batman, uh, Batman, uh, America, Kyoto. Con Pucha, uh, Gaujira, and Supa uh, Mario. Um, I'm probably butchering these, but uh, so katakana is used for a lot of foreign loan words, right? So Batman um, in Japanese, you really can't use uh, two two consonants together in the consonant cluster, so they like to break it up with vowels. Uh, and so anytime you have you know, um, a foreign loan word, they'll have a lot, they'll have a, a word in katakana to represent that. Um, 
with Kata, with Japanese too, I think that they're very inclusive. Whereas I think Chinese tries to figure out ways that they could represent um, an English word in Chinese versus Japanese tries to incorporate the foreign words um, into their pronunciation. Uh, like I said, syllabary, uh, so Cherokee is a type of syllable, and so there's um, a Cherokee alphabet uh, in which certain symbols represent the sound. Here's a very political cartoon about what's going on about Cherokee. Uh, well, not about Cherokee, but about um, English as uh, the national language. Um, development of the alphabet. Uh, so basically, you know, we had this um, very abstract concept and over time it became a little bit more um, arbitrary. And so these uh, alphabetic writing was able to uh, arose out of this. So with alphabetic writing, we have a symbols that represent the sound or morpheme, and it's highly variable. So that means it's very, very, very arbitrary. Um, it you know derives from a lot of the Greek alphabet, the Phoenician alphabet, uh, the form English orthography. So um, alphabetical system is based on the sounds that comprise morphemes, not the shapes, not the objects, not the syllables, but the sounds that make up the syllables and the morphemes. So how do we know this? The C has what sounds? A letter C could mean a k sound or could mean a s sound, right? Like cat or city, right? And so uh, we have one form that represents very different phonemes uh, and very different morphemes depending on how we use them uh, in, the alpha, in our words. So there's some alphabets um, that they call consonantal alphabets. I think it's a misnomer and is very Western based, um, but this is a system in which um, the reader is interpreting a vowel based on the grammatical context. And so this is, uh, for example, Arabic would be considered a consonantal alphabet um, because we have, um, you know, for, the, for example, if you have KTB, a person who could understand Arabic would say, oh, that means katab, which means to write. And so for uh, the Arabic alphabet, you only need the consonants. You don't necessarily need the vowels per se because you have these little diacritics um, above and below the symbol. And Hebrew, for those of you who speak Hebrew or learned it in Jewish school, um, you probably understand that um, this is kind of similar in which there are different um, marks per se. Uh, these different diacritics that changes the sound of what the symbol would be. And so it's kind of like if you had only consonants and that these little marks would represent the vowels and you could try to figure out how to sound these out. So if, like in relation to English, you can still read some of the words based on their consonants. So try reading this paragraph. Uh, even though, you know, it kind of mixes up some of the consonants and some of the vowels. So you can probably understand some of it, right? But I would say that English, unlike the Semitic languages, um, its structure is dependent on vowels for reading and for writing. So if I say, I like to eat out, um, and I took out all the vowels, then you'd be left with L, K, T, 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 which doesn't really make a sentence. And so... Um, we would say English is not a consonantal uh, alphabet. Um, so the discrepancies, when we talk about writing, we talk about the differences between writing and speaking. Um, in that writing is very strange, right? There's some words that you can have the same sound with different spelling. There's some words that you might have a different sound but the same spelling. You might have missing letters. For example, use and fuse. There should be a Y there, right? Use. Um, there's some words with silent letters, such as listen, listen, or debt, debt. Um, and so why is English writing so weird? Well, right, English has gone through a lot of writing reform in that, um, in the Middle English spelling, it sounded very much like what people would say. So for example, indict, debt, receipt, are. 
that sounds a lot like what we would say. That's that looks like a lot like what we would say. Um, kind of like how Spanish is a language in which you can kind of um, read it one, you know, and it looks very much like how you pronounce it. Um, but it wasn't until uh, after you know, in the there was a big reform in which a lot of people said that uh, the dictionary writers said that we should have more. Um, instead of having like a middle English spelling, we should have it more like Latin. And so they had more Latin forms, um, to kind of rejuvenate our spelling. And so for example, uh, we have indict, indebt, and receipt, and hour, uh, with these different Latin forms of spelling. Um, so language changes, but writing doesn't develop fast enough to capture speech. Um, there's, you know this because there's different fads that are associated with speaking, um, but with writing, writing is something that if you have, um, you know, the writing is less likely to change from when you uh, wrote as a child uh, to, well, when you were writing, you know, like when people were writing like 50 years ago versus how they're writing now. Here's a timeline of the Roman alphabet. Um, okay, so let's get to modern writing systems. Um, so there's a funny cartoon that I'm going to show you about how, uh, Asian scripts look like, um, but, uh, it's also very, kind of like a very funny way to those who are very uninitiated, I would say. So the itchy feet guide to differentiating between Asian scripts. Japanese, sharp, stabby letters mixed with loopy, adorable letters. Chinese, various types of buildings under attack by various types of flying contraptions. Hindi, hanging snakes coiled and ready to strike. Korean, making fun of you. Vietnamese, Roman letters all dolled up with fancy hats. Thai, alien, eyeball, tentacle creatures. Mongolian, it's raining knives. Burmese, butts, just butts everywhere. And I actually have a, a Burmese friend uh, on Facebook who writes in this language and it's very nice to see. And I also really like it that Google Translate doesn't automatically translate it uh, into English. So um, beautiful language. So let's talk about Korean. And so for those of you who are learning Korean, maybe you can write uh, about your experiences on the discussion board. So uh, I had the chance to go to Korea this past summer and... Um, one of the things that I noticed is that the Korean people are very, very, very proud of their language. Um, and that's very, you know, they should be because the language was developed by King Sejong, um, who's this king who, you know, for a while, uh, people were, the Korean people were using Chinese alphabet. They were using Chinese for everything. They had a language. They had a Korean language. Um, but the Korean king said, you know what? We're Korean. Uh, we should be able to write uh, Korean. We should be able to... Um, have our own language it's part of our identity but another thing is he wanted to make it simplified so that even the poor people could learn how to read and write and that was very noble and so what he did was he designed the uh, phonemic um, he designed the alphabet phonemically and so all of the consonants are drawn to depict the place and manner of articulation. So you remember when you had to learn IPA and you had to figure out, okay, so what's like a velar nasal and what's like a, you know, like a velar fricative, right? And so all of these represent where you pronounce things. So um, the Hangul, which is the language, um, or the written language actually, uh, this is where, you know, they wrote it in which, um, like a G looks like where your tongue is in the back of your throat when you say G or M looks like a, you know, a box because that's the closing of the lips or like an E, it says E, it says U, like you can imagine where your tongue is placed. This is all ah, right. And so, um, my students, you know, tell me that Korean is a language that you can learn before lunch. Because it's very, very, very easy to figure out what the alphabet is. It's just the grammar is very hard. Hangul is also grouped into blocks. So um, this is an ex example. It's corresponding to each syllable. So for example, um, if I were to take Richard III, now is winter of our discontent. This is how I would block my letters, right? And so lots of um, Korean people 
uh, read this language. I've also heard that you don't actually speak Hangul. Hangul is reserved to the written language. So you always write Hangul. You never speak Hangul. You speak Korean. Um, so the alphabets, they look random, right? They might look random, but they're actually very, very, very strategic. And so a lot of people say that, um, you know, these Asian languages are so hard. Like Japanese has three written languages. It's so hard, right? But if you think about English, English is something that's very difficult as well. So this cartoon also kind of gets at that. It says, did you know that in Korean language, there are seven levels of formality, each with special verb endings? And this girl was like, weird. It says, yeah, I'm glad we're not products of stuffy Eastern cultures with their weird rituals. And the guy's like, yeah. And they high five or whatever. And he says, oh, damn it. I need to call Ted. He's 15 minutes late. And she says, oh, I have a text. Calls make it seem like we're angry. And he goes, uh, maybe just email then. She goes, fine. Oh, and mention that I'm here, but do not CC me. So this is trying to say that, you know, where we think that, oh, these languages, they have so many, like, formal endings. Well, English also has a lot of pragmatic rules as well. Uh, and so I think it's less, you know, I think it's kind of a bias, a Western bias to say that we stuffy Eastern cultures when we have our own. Chinese, Chinese, if you know anything about Chinese history, if you've ever been to China, um, they love to talk about their history of Chinese. It's 5,000 years old. Everything's 5,000 years old. Um, and so Chinese writing is one of the oldest languages that exists. Um, and, and the uninterrupted history dating back to 3,500 years ago. That's crazy. Um, each character represents an individual word or morpheme. But you can combine them using two words, uh, two morphemes, and they have little inflection. Um, so, for example, cat, cats, or uh, th there's no differentiation between he or she, uh, for example. Um, so, for Chinese dictionaries, there's tens of thousands of characters. But you also probably need to know about 5,000 to read a newspaper. Um, I had a student who was an exchange student in China, and he actually took a class on reading the newspaper, which I thought was really fun. Um, and so there's a difference between traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese. And so the difference is that, um, there's some characters where they just like omitted the unneeded strokes, right? So this guy, Li Si, he decided, um, like 3000 characters. He's probably like, we don't really need these strokes, right? And so it's kind of like if we had the word amoeba, right? The useless letter in amoeba is the O. We don't need the O. So it's kind of like simplifying it to just like this, right? Um, so that would be an example of a simplified character. But even though it has a long history, Chinese is something to where the Chinese people have really taken on, you know, new characters. That's totally fine. They can modify old ones. They can, um, you know, they can reduce redundancy um, or add complexity to some characters uh, and so even if it's an older language it doesn't mean that they're stuck in the past and it doesn't you know doesn't mean that they can create new words daily so for example um, this is an ad by uh, with Jackie Chan and uh, you know he has this um, he's talking about this word duang which is like a made-up word, right? It's a, it's like a slang, right? It's a made-up word, duong. But they're able to kind of figure out a character from it. So this is literally Jackie Chan's name um, as a character. And so, you know, the internet and Chinese youth, they're very creative and they can create new characters just like we would create like on fleek uh, or anything like that. So most of the world word uses alphabetical writing. And the internet uses alphabetical writing. Um, and so Chinese and Japanese have not adopted alphabetical transcription, um, have now, you know, that have now adopted alphabetical transcription. So for example, um, Chinese uses like pinyin, for example, for communicating with foreigners or using the internet, or, um, I know that there's different differentiation too, between people who are Taiwanese, uh, and kind of like, you know, even though they use Mandarin, they have different ways of uh, writing the language. And so a lot of people, including, like, including my mom, will use, uh, for example, the pinyin first. I'll search for the pinyin, uh, and then the character will pop up. So this is the Chinese word for panda. So my question is, 
will this replace characters? Will Chinese people eventually just use the alphabetical writing? And I actually had someone uh, in one of my classes, my education classes, say, yes, actually, Chinese people, we, you know, they won't even use characters anymore because the way of the future is alphabetical writing. And I was like, no, not quite. First of all, Chinese people have 5,000 years of history. They're not just going to give up something, right? Um, Chinese is still a form of calligraphy. It's a form of art. It's a form of history, okay? So, for example, like, look at this. It's a very beautiful cursive script in Chinese, right? Um, and so I, you know, I want this like printed on my wall and a lot of people get this tattooed, uh, or they get grapefruit tattooed on their body. Right. And so we think of Chinese as something that's very artistic, you know? So when was the last time that you typed a letter on your computer and just sat back and you were like, wow, I want this printed on my wall or I want this R tattooed on my body. Um, so I think that it's, you know, it's, it's I don't think that they're going to give away, uh, characters for alphabetical writing anytime soon. Um, also, when you think about culturally, Chinese has uh, a lot of different dialects, like we talked about in the, earlier in the semester, um, and so it's seen as a unifying factor among different dialects. Whereas one person who maybe doesn't speak um, Mandarin, uh, they could just write down the language and be be understood. And so a lot of people did this when I went to China. They wrote down. Um, you know, they saw I couldn't speak Mandarin, so they wrote it down, uh, but I also can't read it as well, so that was, like, a fast way to lose friends, um, and remember, language is inherently a form of identity, right, and so if you're going to be, um, if you're a part of, uh, if you're Chinese, this is something about who you are, and if you're going to speak a language, like we talked about with pigeons and creoles, if it's part of who you are, it's never going to die. So with technology, is writing becoming obsolete? A lot of people wrote on the discussion board, like, you know, you really hate it when the youths, they say LOL, and they say it in person, right? So is writing something that's, that's destroying the English language? Um, when we talk about text messaging, you know, there's different rules of texting, right? So how long should you text someone? Uh, or if you're going to text with romantic intent, or what are some misunderstandings, right? So like with the recent uh, controversy uh, in the news, like what are some misunderstandings that could be caused by texting? So, you know, what does this mean? What's the underlying assumption? If someone says, hey, want to meet up this weekend? And you say, hey, this weekend will work for me, maybe some other time. What does that mean? Hey, what are you up to this weekend? Not sure. How about you? Is this person interested? Hey, that was fun last night. Hey, with like six Ys. That was fun last night. Hey, with like four Ys. Yeah, I want to do something this weekend. Hey, that was fun last night. Hi. Yeah, thanks. So what makes, you know, what's the difference? And then what makes uh, texting distinct from other types of written or spoken speech? Um... So you probably know all of this, but you could probably talk about it in the discussion board about what makes language very different than writing, or sorry, what makes texting very different than speaking. Um, is texting destroying the English language? So I want you to kind of watch this docu or watch this video with John McWhorter, who's a linguist, um, I think from Columbia, but now I think he teaches in California. Uh, so discussion board questions for this week are discuss why you think linguists are hesitant to say Chinese won't give up characters for Roman scripts. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Why? What are the advantages and disadvantages that non-Romanized scripts have over alphabetic scripts? And then two, what are the rules behind texting? How is this compared to John McWhorter's idea of linguist speech? If you feel comfortable, share some of the text you sent recently and discuss what were the underlying messages. I'm very interested this week to see uh, what you have to say. You can ignore the rest of the PowerPoint about dyslexia, although if you want to look at it, you could. Uh, and I'll see you for the last, the last uh, lecture very soon.